From Surly Brewing Company, it is the Dumpster Fire 2020. I sure hope this doesn't end up being an annual release. If you've ever thought about running your own servers for home or business use, but don't want to deal with the headaches of maintaining hardware, why not let Linode host your services for you? They make it simple to deploy and manage your own cloud infrastructure, with solutions ranging from a single shared CPU to massive multi-core virtual machines. You can even add in dedicated enterprise GPUs for machine learning. With shared CPU plans starting at as little as $5 per month and scaling up to as high as you need to go, you'll be able to find a hosting plan that fits your needs. They also have 24-7, 365 support available, regardless of your plan size. That's a better support plan than I have on my personal server rack, I can tell you that much. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing. And thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So I mentioned in the last video that I usually have really good luck when it comes to hardware reliability. However, it seems I'm paying all of my dues at once. Starting last week with the realization I needed to replace all of my Seagate Constellation ES2 Enterprise hard drives out of my FreeNAS box, and moving on to today, where this is the motherboard out of my TrueNAS server. And you'll notice it's not in my TrueNAS server. So this motherboard right here, the Gigabyte PA7PESH2, has been a staple of my home lab for the last two and a half years. I first bought it to be my only virtualization server, and then when I finally started upgrading to some better and better hardware for that, I moved this over into my TrueNAS box. Now, a dual socket Xeon motherboard with five PCI Express expansion slots is probably overkill for most home NAS servers. However, in my case, I do use this NAS primarily to edit the videos that you all like watching. And so I actually do take advantage of every single aspect of this board. Sure, the CPUs are definitely overpowered with 12 cores and 24 threads in total at 3.3 gigahertz. It is nice to have that single threaded performance when I'm trying to upload and even pull data off to do my editing. The board has three built-in mini SAS connection ports, meaning it can control up to 12 hard drives without the use for a bay expander. With 16 DIMM slots on board, getting 128 gigabytes of RAM on here was pretty trivial and inexpensive, given the low price of 8 gigabyte DDR3 DIMMs. And while most people don't fill up all of their PCI Express slots, I actually managed to populate every single one of these, especially after I started adding cache cards to my NAS array. So why is this motherboard on the table? Well, unfortunately, it's not because I'm upgrading, it's because the board just flat out died. And it died very, very slowly. Uh, for about the last three months or so, I was having issues with the server just randomly locking up in the middle of the night. Nothing was being accessed, the server certainly wasn't working all that hard, but I would wake up to a failed backup notification. I'd go to check the server and the file server was just offline. It's powered on, but offline. A quick reboot and everything would come right back up as usual with no lingering issues. And so I just chalked it up to random happenstance. However, when it randomly happens like 10 times in a week, it's time to start investigating. I started going through component by component on the system, trying to figure out where the issue was coming from. Checked the memory, all of the add-in cards, even swapped out CPUs a couple of times, and the server itself has been in and out of my rack probably at least a dozen times over the last couple of months. In the end, it wound up being the motherboard. In fact, today, I can't even turn the system on. When I press the power button, I'll get a small relay click, and then the system will immediately turn itself back off. So, we have a brand new motherboard to swap in. But I figured if I have to take the whole system apart anyway, I might as well do a couple of upgrades while I'm in there. Now, we will be sticking with the 2011 CPU platform, but I will be upgrading the chips themselves, from the E5-2643 CPUs up to the E5-4627 V2 CPUs, so going from Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge and 4 cores to 8 cores. Memory will be sticking with the same capacity of 128GB in total, but I am swapping out the 8GB DIMMs for 16GB DIMMs, still at 1866 and ECC registered. This gives me some expansion potential in the future if I feel I need to upgrade to 256GB. I'm also going to be adding in a new host bus adapter, which should be pretty obvious since the Gigabyte motherboard has a built-in SAS controller. I picked up this unit, which is a Dell HBA330, which I believe is based on the LSI 9300 SAS controller. The main difference is the old SAS controller uses a 6 gigabit mini SAS connection. This one actually uses a 12 gigabit. 
Now, the backplane in my Supermicro 846 is still a six gigabit connection, but if I ever wanted to swap that out for something else, this will give me the option to get some more speed out of my hard drive arrays. Of course, doing that upgrade might necessitate a new chassis, so we'll see if that need ever arises. The other major change is I'm going to be virtualizing my TrueNAS install using Proxmox. This gives a couple of advantages. Number one, if I wanted to back up my TrueNAS server and then just slap it onto another Proxmox server, all I need to do is transfer the HBA into a new server and I can fire up my existing TrueNAS configuration. Versus right now, I'm gonna have to back up the configuration, install TrueNAS fresh, and refresh the configuration, which works, but I'd rather have the versatility of having all of my systems inside of a VM. So now that you know all the problems that I'm trying to solve, why don't we say how we're going to solve them? First off, I'm moving to the Supermicro X9DAI, which is again, still a dual 2011 motherboard, but has a full six PCI Express expansion slots, all of them being X8 or higher. Now, a couple notes here, and that's that the X9DAI is actually a workstation board and not a server board. So I am giving up a couple features with that. For one, I don't have IPMI on this motherboard. And number two, there's no video output on here. Meaning if I want video output out of the server, I'm gonna have to plug in a video card. However, I am currently working on a solution to share a graphics card both with the host and with a virtual machine inside of it. So make sure you're subscribed if you don't wanna miss that one. The CPUs again are the Xeon E5 4627V2, which are 3.3 gigahertz, eight core, eight threaded CPUs with a turbo of four gigahertz, which means these are the fastest single threaded CPUs available for this platform, excluding the enthusiast chips and overclocking. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and take a backup of my TrueNAS configuration, power down the server and bring it in here so I can finally get the motherboard swapped out. And I'm sure you're wondering, well, if the server is still running, why is the motherboard already on your desk? And that's a great question. That's because when this motherboard decided to die, the only system I had with enough PCI Express slots was my Z390 9900K. So if you think my dual Xeon system is overkill, yeah, I'll be right back. So that all went exactly as planned, by which I mean it took a lot longer than I expected. Come on, you didn't really expect me to finish that in one day, did you? First and foremost, I did have to make a couple changes to the plans along the way, starting with the fact that I am not going to be virtualizing my TrueNAS server inside of Proxmox. The main reason for that is I had a fair number of issues getting IOMMU set up on this board, especially with the number of PCI Express devices that I wanted to pass through. Essentially, I wanted TrueNAS to have physical access to five out of the six PCI Express devices I installed in the server. So why am I bothering to virtualize it at all? Secondly, I wanted TrueNAS to have access to all 128 gigabytes of memory, meaning that I would have had to fully allocate everything inside of the virtual machine, leaving none left for any other VMs that I wanted to run. Also, the fact that I installed eight core, eight threaded CPUs meant that I was locked down to, well, not nearly as many threads to distribute across multiple virtual machines. So running this on bare hardware seemed like the best alternative. I was also not able to get the Dell HBA330 to play nicely inside of TrueNAS. While the controller card is just a rebranded LSI 9308i, the OS would refuse to load whenever the card was installed in the system. 
even after confirming that the HBA was able to see all 24 discs, and making sure it was not set up as a boot device in the system, I was still not able to get the card to boot up into TrueNAS. Instead, I was left with the error message of root mount waiting on cam, which typically means that the HBA wasn't able to actually spin up the drives properly and pass them through to the OS. So for the time being, I had to roll back to my HP H240 HBA, and I will definitely be swapping that out for something else here in the very near future. I also ran into an issue with my Sun F80 cards that I have never experienced with any system I've ever worked with before. And that is that when both cards were connected to the system, the BIOS would act as if it were corrupted or out of memory. Now this could be that both of the Sun cards were presenting themselves with boot ROMs to the BIOS, so you could select them as boot devices. However, whenever that happened, none of the tabs would show up at the top of my BIOS, and some of the menu options below that would either be blank or a garbled and corrupted mess. Now this was a pretty simple fix. All I had to do was tell the Sun F80s to not present their boot ROMs to the BIOS, meaning that I would not be able to boot off them. Not that I was going to do that anyway. But it was a little bit frustrating as for quite some time, I couldn't select either UEFI or legacy BIOS or even which boot device I wanted to use. The BIOS was just unusable. As far as getting everything back up and running, I could have just thrown my old boot drives into the new system and it probably would have worked just fine. However, I wanted to do a fresh install of TrueNAS just to make sure that no lingering issues from either my hard drive swaps or any of the hardware swaps were going to present themselves in the future. Like I mentioned, before I started the hardware swap, I took a backup of my existing TrueNAS configuration. Once all the new hardware was nestled into its new home, I simply reinstalled TrueNAS and then uploaded the old configuration file. A quick reboot later and all of my ZFS pools, file shares, and accounts and permissions were all restored and back up and running. So like I said, this one did go pretty well according to plan, even if I did have a couple unexpected wrenches thrown into the middle of it as far as hardware compatibility goes. I will be following up with the Dell HBA330 to see if I can possibly flash the firmware over to an LSI 9308i. That should give me a little bit better throughput and performance on my hard drive arrays, even though I'm only going to be taking advantage of the 6 gigabit performance instead of the 12 gigabit performance that that card is technically capable of. So far, I'm pretty happy with the way the upgrade went, and this latest round of hardware should last my TrueNAS server for at least the next year or two, or at least until the next time I get that home lab upgrade itch. But that leads me perfectly to the question for the day, and that is, what hardware do you run in your home server, and what's your next planned upgrade? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are also down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. As I said in the intro, Surly Brewing Company, Dumpster Fire 2020. This is a hazy IPA clocking in at 9.3%. Boy, it says hazy IPA, but this is one of the clearest hazy IPAs I have ever seen in my life. Double dry hopped hazy IPA. It says it right there on the pile of cardboard. Years ago, we released a beer called Dumpster Fire, named after a literal dumpster fire in our parking lot. We thought we'd never need to brew a second version. We thought wrong. As 2020's metaphorical dumpster fire rages out of control, we're making the best of this mess with a double dry hopped hazy IPA, brimming with juicy hop flavor. Cheers to you, 2020. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <sighs> I'm sorry, but 9.3% uh, and the tasting notes are good, f and riddance. Well played. Okay, there's the haze now that it's kind of settled in. Uh, it's still not completely opaque though. Oh, that's good. That is really good. Man, that's a whole new flavor experience when you don't have the hazy level of hazy. Uh, we've always known that there's really good flavors in there, but getting them out from the acid burn has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges of the hazy IPA craze. Uh, this has the potential to be my favorite hazy yet. That is seriously good. It's thick bodied and hoppy, yet still light and citrusy and playful and refreshing, kind of all at the same time. Man, I'm, I'm calling it. 
This is my favorite hazy ever.